Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1210, Calculus 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be a professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture 20, we're going to continue to talk about some so-called shortcuts in terms of calculating derivatives of functions. Uh, much like in the previous lecture, number, number 19, we learned about the power rule, which we can use to compute the derivatives of power functions. In lecture 20, we're going to talk about the product and quotient rules. This video will focus on the product rule, and the next video in lecture 20 will have to do with the quotient rule. So let's first talk about why there is a need for product rule. That is to say, in the, in the previous lecture, we learned about a sum and difference rules, that if you want to take the... If you have a sum of two functions, you know, f of x plus g of x, and you take their derivative, then it turns out to just be f prime of x plus g prime of x. And this follows from uh, basically limit properties. That is, the derivative of a sum is a sum of derivatives. Why does that not work for products? Well, we'll see that in this example right here. So consider the function f of x and g of x. f of x is given as 2x plus 3, and g of x is given as 3x squared. If we take the derivative of f, by the rules we've learned previously, its derivative will be 2, and the derivative of g would be then a 6x, again, by the product rule and linearity of the derivative. And so if we compute the product of f prime and g prime, this is just going to look like 2 times 6x, which gives us 12x. On the other hand, if we actually multiply out f of x by g of x, notice this will give us a 2x plus 3 times a 3x squared, for which we can just distribute the 3x squared throughout, we end up with a 6x cubed plus 9x squared. And so from here, if we calculate the derivative, that is if we take the derivative of f of x times g of x, we're going to take the derivative of the 6x cubed plus 9x squared, which again, by the power rule and, and the like, we're going to end up with an 18x squared plus an 18x for which when you compare that to the 12x we had before, we can see that's grossly inaccurate. It doesn't, it doesn't give us the correct derivative. So it turns out the derivatives of products are a little bit more complicated than just multiplying the product of the derivatives. So it turns out the correct product rule is going to be given by the following formula. If f and g are both differentiable functions, then the derivative of f times g will look like the function f times the derivative of g plus the function g times the derivative of f. So the way you look at it, it's a sum of two products. So there's going to be some two products involved in the product rule. And with each of those products, you have the original function and a derivative, the original function and the derivative. And you look at the two combinations. So you have f and the derivative of g, and then you have g and the derivative of f, like so. That's the product rule. Let's see why that is. Well, in order to prove this formula, we're going to look at the definition of the derivative as a limit of a difference quotient. But before we do that, let's look at the following algebraic calculation. Just consider the quantity uh, f of t times g of t minus g of x, and add to that g of x times f of t minus f of x. This quantity will be important to us in just a second as we look at the difference quotient uh, in, in consideration here. So let's just consider its simplification. Uh, all we know about t and x is that there's two separate uh, variables right here. If you distribute f of t, you're going to get f of t times g of t. Subtract from that f of t times g of x, okay? And similarly, if you distribute the g of x, you're going to get g of x times f of t minus f of x times g of t. Now, you'll notice there are some like terms going on here. We have an f of t g of x, and we have a g of x times f of t. Those are going to cancel out, giving us simply just an f of t times g of t minus an f of x times g of x. Now, I should point out to you that when you talk about the function f times g evaluated at x, that means you take the output of the f function and you times it by the output of the g function. So f of x times g of x is just f times g evaluated at x. Likewise, f of t times g of t is just f times g evaluate at the parameter t like so. So be aware that this quantity right here is equal to this one just by that uh, algebraic simplification. Now let's go to the difference quotient here. Uh, the derivative of f times g evaluated x here, the, the derivative with respect to x, this is the limit of the difference quotient. And this difference quotient is going to look like the limit as t approaches x of this slope formula f g of t minus f g of x all over t minus x. So this is the version of the derivative uh, that looks more like that slope 
of uh, secant land. That is, we're taking the limit of the secant slopes there. Now you'll notice this thing in the numerator that we see here is exactly this friend right here, fg of t minus fg of x, uh, for which by the by the computation we did above, we can make this substitution in right here. That becomes this. We get this more expanded numerator. This expanded numerator is going to be more useful for us in terms of our limit properties. So we do have this, we have this plus inside of the numerator. We're going to break it up into two fractions. So we got the limit as x, uh, t approaches x of ft, g of t minus g of x all over t minus x plus g of x times ft minus fx over t minus x right here. So we have two different summands inside of the limit. So breaking those into separate pieces, this would give the limit as t approaches x of f of t times g of t minus g of x all over t minus x. And then you're going to add to it, again, separately, a separate limit here, the limit as t approaches x of g of x times f of t minus f of x all over t minus x. So limit properties provide that for us. But then when you look at this limit right here, you have a factorization. You have f of t times gt minus gx over t minus x. We can factor this limit into two limits. The limit as t approaches x of f of t, and then the limit as t approaches x of g of t minus g of x over t minus x. We're going to do the same thing for the second limit here as well. We can factor it so that we take the limit of g of x, and then we take the limit of f of t minus f of x over t minus x. Why do we do that? Well, when you look at this right here, we have the limit as t approaches x of a difference quotient. This difference quotient is the difference quotient associated to the derivative. And since g is differentiable, this limit will exist and the limit will be g prime of x. This is the derivative. Likewise, this here, we take the limit as t approaches x of f of t minus f of x over t minus x. This is the difference quotient that gives us the derivative of f. And so this will be equal to f prime at x. What about the other two things? Well, this one right here is sort of a curious creature. If you take the limit of g of x as t approaches x, notice g of x doesn't actually depend on t. So as t gets closer and closer and closer and closer to x, who cares? g of x doesn't depend on t, so g of x is constant with respect to t. So as the limit approaches x, g of x will just stay g of x. And so as a constant, you get equal to that one. So the last one I want to consider is the limit as t approaches x of f of t. This is, this is the most curious of them all, because as t approaches x, f of t will change, right? f of t does depend on t. So as you change the input t, that'll change the output f of t. I claim that still is equal to f of x, but for a different reason. The limit as t approaches x of f of t is equal to f of x because f is continuous. A continuous function is exactly those functions for which you can evaluate the function at the value and that'll give you the limit. How do we know that f was t if, or excuse me, f is continuous? If you go back to the original problem, it's like, what do we know about f? f is differentiable. But aha, as we've seen previously, every differentiable function is necessarily continuous. So since we assumed f is differentiable, we know it's continuous. And so that then gives us the product formula we need right here. So let's look at an example of this. Let's use the product rule to compute the derivative of 2x plus 3 times 3x squared prime. Hmm, this, this function might look familiar somewhere. This is These are the functions we were looking at before we proved the product rule. So by the product rule we just saw on the previous slide, well, let's, let's say that this function here is f, and let's say this function right here is g of x. Oh, wait, that's what we called them earlier. So by the product rule, the derivative here is going to equal, remember, f of x times g prime of x plus g of x times f prime of x. For which if we calculate these things, we see that f of x is just 2x plus 3. No big deal there. g prime of x is going to be a 6x like we saw previously. Uh, you then multiply that by, of course, g of x, which is 3x squared. And then you times that by the derivative of f, which we previously saw was 2. Uh, distribute here, we're going to get 12x squared plus 18x. And then the next one's going to be a 6x squared. Combining like terms, we add up to get an 18x squared plus 18x, which you'll recall that this right here, 18x squared plus 18x, this was equal to the derivative we calculated previously. 
which you remember seeing that right here when we did this example. So this formula does in fact give us the correct derivative of a product. Let's apply the product rule to find the derivative of y equals the square root of x plus three times x squared minus five. So by the product rule, we see that the derivative here of y is gonna look like the first function, the first factor, I should say, the square root of x plus three. You're gonna times that by the derivative of the second function. And then you're going to take the first factor. If you want it, if you don't, if you don't want to put in that order, that's okay. You can keep it as the square root of the first fact, or square root of x plus three, which is the first factor. Take its derivative, times it by x squared minus five x right here. So the thing is, when it comes to multiplication and sums, the order doesn't matter. The operation is commutative. So all that you need is you have to have a factor. You have to have products where in each of the products you're going to take one of the derivatives. So if you want to keep them in the same order, that's fine. So you have the first, and then the second, and then the first and then the second. That's perfectly fine. Just make sure that on one of them, you take the derivative of the second, and on the other, you take the derivative of the first factor. If you do that, you're gonna be just fine. So let's compute these derivatives here. Uh, rewriting the first factor, the square root of x plus three, I'm gonna write that as a, uh, as a power function uh, because it'll be more helpful with the algebraic calculations that are gonna follow. So we get x to the one half plus three. The derivative of x squared minus five x will be a two x minus five. And then for the next one, we have to take the derivative here. The square root of x, remember, is x to the one-half power. So we get one-half times x to the negative one-half power. The derivative of the plus three is zero. Derivative of constant just disappears. And then we get an x squared minus 5x, right? So, so we do want to combine like terms. So we're going to have to foil these things out. x to the one-half times 2x will give us a 2x to the three-halves. Took the one-half power plus the first power. Then we're going to get a negative 5 times x to the one-half. Now let's multiply by the three. Three times two x gives me a six x. Three times negative five gives us a negative 15. And then for the last one, if we distribute the one half x to the negative one half power, we're gonna end up with one half x to the three halves. Notice I took the second power minus one half. And then lastly, you're gonna get a negative five halves times x to the one half power. One minus a half is one half. So let's combine some like terms if we can. Notice there is, uh, x to the three halves, that's common. There's also x to the one half, that's common. So if we combine those coefficients together, I noticed the biggest power of x turns out to be x to the three halves. So we're gonna have two plus a half, which is five halves, x to the three halves, like so. The next biggest power would then be x, x to the first, for which we have a six x. Uh, the next biggest power would be x to the one half, for which we're gonna have a negative five half of negative five, minus a negative five halves. So that'll combine together to give me a negative 15 halves. Notice five just became 10 over two there, times x to the one half. And then the only th other thing we have an accommodated for is the negative 15, in which case I'm just gonna leave the answer like this. If you wanna turn them back into uh, square roots instead of the one half power, that's fine. But this gives us the derivative of our function in this situation using the product rule. As another example, let's find the nth derivative of f of x equals x to the e to the x times e to the x here. So the nth derivative, that's, we wanna find higher derivatives. So let's start off with say like the first derivative, okay? So if we take the first derivative, that should be f prime of x. So we need to take the derivative here using the product rule, which would look like x prime e to the x plus x times e to the x prime. If you take the derivative of x with respect to x, that's gonna give you a one, one times e to the x. As we've also previously seen, if you take the derivative e to the x, that is itself e to the x. Um, I noticed that both of these factors here, uh, both these products involve e to the x. I could factor it out, give you e to the x. Um, I'm going to write it as x plus 1 times e to the x. Uh, this is the x that came from there, and then here's the 1 that came through there. Wrote it in a slightly different order, but you get x plus 1 times e to the x. That would be the first derivative. How about the second derivative? We want to want to calculate the second derivative here, f double prime. That just means the derivative of the derivative. So we have to take the derivative of x plus one times e to the x, take that, take that prime. Well, we're gonna use the product rule again. We're gonna get x plus one prime times e to the x plus x plus one times e to the x prime. For which x plus one, if you take its derivative, you're gonna again get a one, right? Times e to the x. And then if you take the derivative of e to the x, like we saw earlier, you're gonna get an e to the x. If we factor out the e to the x, that leaves behind one plus x plus one, which combining the ones together, you're gonna to end up with a x plus two times e to the x. So, okay, well, that's the second derivative. 
it wants to know the nth derivative. Is there a general pattern we can find here? Well, we're getting close to it. Let's try the third derivative. I think we will uh, be able to use some reasoning to figure out what the next derivative is going to be after that. If you take the derivative of x plus 2 e to the x here, again, using the product rule, we get x plus 2 times e to the x prime. By the product rule, we're going to get x plus 2 prime e to the x plus x plus 2 times e to the x prime. For which the derivative of x plus 2, that's going to turn out just to be a 1. Then you get an e to the x. And then the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x again. If we factor out the e to the x, we're going to end up with a 1 plus x plus 2, which putting that all together, we're going to end up with x plus 3 e to the x. And so now we wonder, what is the nth derivative of this function right here? What's the pattern? And so zooming out so we can see all of these ones together, let's do it this way. You'll notice x plus 1 e to the x, x plus 2 e to the x, x plus 3 e to the x. Um, I should also mention that sometimes we talk about the zeroth derivative. That is, if you take the z derivative zero times, that's just the original function. So if you don't ever take any derivatives, that's just the original function. The original function could be written as x plus 0 e to the x. And so with this in mind, notice that the derivative always looks like x plus, the nth derivative should look like x plus n to the e to the x. And where did that come from? Well, the idea here is with the product rule, you're always going to get what you had before, the x plus something times e to the x. Well, when you take the derivative of e to the x, something happens. So you have that x plus whatever you had before. But then when you take the derivative of x plus whatever, you're going to get a 1. So you always get an extra e to the x. And so the number of e to the x's you have seems to increase every single time. So we see that the nth derivative of f right here is going to look like x plus x.